Good morning, Ed. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, getting my caffeine ready. Uh, it's it's actually Friday. You, you you were saying earlier, just before we got in camera, that it's Monday because actually when people watch this, it's going to be Monday. But uh, doing okay. Yeah, we're recording at uh, a much earlier time. It's about 9 a.m. on Friday, and we're pounding uh, caffeine to stay awake. Exactly. I have a massive mug in front of me right here to uh, to get it started. Yeah, it looks like an oil drum. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ed, we're going to be doing an Ask Me Anything this morning, uh, just chatting a little bit, uh, some questions that have come in uh, from our subscribers, uh, and talking a little bit about some of the things that we do beyond, behind the scenes, and a little bit more informally uh, about how we think about some of the stories we cover. Yeah, I think that'll be good. And, you know, I actually asked, uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was just to uh, start it off, uh, even though we're doing the subscribers ask, maybe we can have a little back and forth in terms of ask about the economy and markets, um, yeah. you know, because we're doing this on a Friday after a, a good jobs number. We had a huge sell off yesterday. I was just wondering, what do you think about uh, what happened yesterday in the markets? And, uh, and I can tell you what I'm thinking. Well, you know, it's I would tee it right back to you and say that, uh, you know, your credit write down pieces from Tuesday and Wednesday proved to be uh, astonishingly prescient in talking about some of the underlying instability in U.S. equity markets. Uh, and we had that conversation, I guess it was uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, about some of the challenges that had underlaid the system for a very long time. And we've known that this fragility was in place is something that we've talked about. Uh, there's been a decoupling clearly uh, from the real economy, uh, productivity, employment, uh, all the core factors that one thinks about uh, with an economy, uh, and the U.S. equity markets, uh, driven largely by the policy response, uh, primarily from the Federal Reserve, but also on the fiscal side. Yeah, so I mean, the way I'm thinking of it, and and, and thanks uh, about uh, it being prescient, uh, Charlie McElligot, he was saying that, yeah, because <laughs> I, I, I um, he was saying pretty much the same thing, literally the, the day of, that we were going to get like a 6 to 8% down day, and we ended up getting a 5% down day. Um, I, I think that uh, really what I'm concerned about is downside risk in terms of an air pocket being larger even than the one that we saw now, like a consistent sort of selling wave here in September and October. So I'm not really that concerned with a 5% down day on the NASDAQ. I know it's the worst day that they've had since March, but really going forward, uh, maybe you could say if you're Jay Pulaski, who I spoke to, who's relatively uh, upbeat, is, yeah, you needed a 5 to 10 percent correction because we're overextended. And then maybe you can consolidate and go further. So it's not really bad in the overall scheme of things to the degree that everything was extended. The real question is, is, yeah, this dichotomy between the real economy and the financial economy, how do you close it? And uh, to move straight into the real economy, I think that's where the rubber hits the road about what happened today. That gives a little bit more fuel to the upside. That is, uh, all the numbers that I saw were good from the jobs report. The, it was bang on in terms of the actual uh, number of jobs added. Uh, the unemployment rate went way down, partially because the uh, household survey was so good in terms of the number of jobs added. Uh, labor force participation was higher. Uh, so it was all good. Um, so I think that, you know, it remains to be seen what happens in terms of the real economy, what happens in terms of stimulus, uh, fiscal and monetary policy going forward. But I think you're right that we're at a, a juncture now where you're going to have more volatility and, and we're going to have to close that gap between the real economy and the financial economy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, the employment situation report that comes out, uh, we should think about doing just an entirely separate piece on that on a monthly basis because it is so critical. Uh, as a general rule, it's an incredibly important uh, piece of data that comes out from BLS at the Labor Department, that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But during periods uh, when employment numbers are under stress, it's absolutely critical. You know, you pointed out uh, that it was the household survey, that data uh, sources, actually two data sources together, uh, it's the household survey and the establishment survey. When you look through it, there uh, the tables are numbered differently. There are the A tables and the B tables. Uh, we could go uh, into the wonkery there uh, at a at a real high level of granularity. Maybe we'll do that at some point. Uh, but to your point, uh, definitely the data shows improvement. And uh, you know, when we're looking for incremental change, change at the margin, that's the place to look. You know, before we move into all the other questions that we have, I just want to make one more. Uh, 
play on the markets and the um, and the economy because it has to do with jobless claims that came out on Thursday. The, I don't know if you saw, but the jobless claims numbers that they had that came out, they changed the way that they do the, uh, and you know, we've been talking about this, you and I, for uh, months now, the fact that uh, the uh, seasonally adjusted numbers were wrong in some capacity. So now that they've changed them to be more on, on point, the problem, however, is, is those numbers are really high. Uh, and when you, uh, you we're talking like 800,000 initial claims every single month uh, going forward. So when you look at the numbers from 2009, that's when we had a recovery, March 2009 into 2010. Those numbers were clocking in at a, a massive 500 to 600,000. That was the most that you could see in any sort of recovery ever since uh, this data uh, came into existence. Uh, back in 1967. And we're now, you know, 25, 30, 40 percent higher than that. So what does that say about uh, where the unemployment number is going to go uh, in the future? So the number that we just got today is you could say that's the past. OK, that was like two or three weeks ago. What about the future? The future that I see is actually one in which potentially the unemployment uh, rate goes up. Uh, going forward. That's certainly what we saw in 2009. The Fed has a, a bogey at 9.3% uh, for the end of the year. We're at 8.4% now. Is it possible that, uh, you, know, we'll, you know, they totally missed the ball and that actually the economy is going to be even better than we thought? Maybe. But I think that the data, uh, they point to a potential increase going forward. And so to the degree that you're going to close that gap between the real economy and the financial economy. Uh, some of that gap is going to be closed by the financial economy coming to meet uh, the real economy down, as opposed to the real economy moving up towards the financial economy. Yeah, well said. And I would add, it's worth remarking also, you were ahead of the curve on this one as well. You've had a heck of a run. Basically, uh, you threw out the seasonally adjusted numbers uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, nope, I'm just going from the unadjusted uh, numbers because uh, the, the the adjustments are just not working any longer. And uh, it seems as though uh, perhaps we have some uh, some viewers at uh, government economists who are uh, who are watching our show. You know, they, <laughs> they probably knew that on their own. They could see that. It was just an egregious example. And, and you really were uh, about a week or 10 days ahead of the curve before other media outlets started doing the same and saying, we've got to adjust uh, or unadjust, rather, these numbers because the seasonal adjustment factors are just causing more distortions. Yeah. And, and to, to be honest with you, though, I've been talking about this since uh, May. I, I uncovered a, 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 a Twitter thing with uh, Felix Salmon and Claudia Sam, who was on our network at some point uh, mm -hmm. in May, talking about these seasonal adjustments, you, you know, they're totally distorted. This is back when we got like 30 uh, million uh, jobless claims in the first three or four weeks, I was saying, actually, if you look at the unadjusted numbers, they're really, you know, the mat, there's a, a difference of like 3 million claims between adjusted and uh, unadjusted. We got to actually, you know, look at, this is a, a totally new scenario. So now we're seeing that, that it's new. So on some level, you could say that the data just in general, we can't really know we're, how good the data are. So we just have to look at the trend. And uh, for me, the trend now is uh, it, it's inconclusive. So uh, as I said, it, you could have the data coming up uh, to meet the, uh, the financial economy. I don't really think that that's what's going to happen. I think that they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. And that means that there is, uh, you know, there's still downside uh, risk in, in financial markets. Yeah. And it's a lot faster to reprice risk than it is to restart an economy. Yes, without a doubt. So with that, uh, what's uh, what kind of questions do you have for us? Let's take a look. We got some questions here from subscribers, uh, and they're pretty varied and interesting. So here's an interesting question, uh, Ed, for you from Alex. Will you consider getting back into politics, or are you done with that world? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I was never really in politics, to be honest with you. I, I was in the Foreign Service, U.S. Foreign Service. I was a diplomat. I served one term over in Germany. 
I was supposed to serve another term in Mexico. That was my onward post. But instead of going, I ended up going to business school and then never looked back. And, you know, the reason I left at the time was, yeah, it is uh, politics on some level. But let me put it this way. I remember that uh, the, the, the ambassador to uh, Germany from the United States was a guy, Richard Holbrook, uh, who mm. a lot of people know. And yeah, when... Bill Clinton came to visit. He was just like sprinting to do any and everything to hang out with Bill Clinton. He had no interest in anything that was going on in Germany itself. He was really positioning himself to become the assistant secretary of state, which he then later became in order to do the Dayton Accords. I remember my boss at the time, he was standing in front of, uh, of Holbrook, who was reading something. And Holbrook was, uh, he had his shoes on the, uh, he had his feet on the desk and his sh and his shoes were removed and so were his socks. It was, you know, totally disrespectful. And he, he was reading this piece of paper and he was like, you know, who who is uh, I I can't say the name because I don't want to out him. Who is this person uh, that I'm t I'm reading about? And the, my boss was like, that person is me. You know, he had he had no idea who he was working with, no respect for them, et cetera. And then lo and behold, uh, you know, a month later, he was made assistant secretary of state. Meanwhile, all the people who um, I worked with, you know, they were they were digging in the trenches to for formulate policy, and all the policy was being made by people like Richard Holbrook back in Washington D.C. So, you know, the diplomatic core of the mid '90s was actually a precursor of what we see today. That is a centralization of policy. That is our foreign policy being made by people who have preconceived notions of what they want and doing it top down, not listening to people in the field. We're, we were just there to do demarches, to deliver the, the U.S. message abroad. So to me, that was not an interesting career. And it also has informed how I see where we've headed over time in the intervening 20s odd years, that basically the United States, we're not really using our policy apparatus in the right way. We're just top downing it. You get ideologues every four, every eight years that come in and say, this is how we wanted to do it. Let's bully our, our allies into supporting us and, and let's go from there. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. So long winded answer, but it, it wasn't for me. It showed me politics, the politics of being in government. So I left. That was a much more grim answer than I was expecting it. <laughs> I mean, it's really depressing to basically hear what it sounds like you're saying is that it's politics before data, right? Yeah. I, to, to me, the the most insidious part of it, if you go through successive administrations, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, is when you think about what's actually happening on the ground from a foreign policy perspective, underneath the surface, that's what's really happening, that the people at the top uh, on the, I, I guess it's the seventh floor, I can't remember, at the State Department, now with Mon Mike Pompeo, they have their preconceived notions of, of the, how the world is. They're not listening to people uh, you know, in Germany or in Moscow. Uh, they're not listening to people in Tokyo. They're giving those people orders, telling them what to do, how to get it done. Uh, so it's not a real uh, you know, uh, back and forth at all. And, and, you know, in today's world, people talk about the deep state over and over again. You know, these are people at the State Department, you know, who are non-political. They're just serving uh, the administrations one after the next. They're trying to do their job. But, you know, now they're considered to be uh, holdovers from a previous administration uh, over and over again. And that's the world that we're in now. I think it's just deeply troubling. Uh, yeah. and, and what I see now... I was informed by 25 years ago, it's just degraded even more over time. That's a depressing answer. But it also reminds me of what it is that I find so intriguing about markets, which is if you come with your preconceived notions and you don't adjust to reality, you get smashed. It's yeah, if you that, I, that's exactly how, why, that's why I like about yeah. markets too. Whereas in the policy world, you can bully your way into making the world as you, you, you want it. Maybe you'll make some blunders, but you won't get spanked in the way that you will uh, in the markets. Yeah, it's one of the few places where there truly is a feedback mechanism where the real world crashes into ideology and the real world generally wins.
Yeah, generally. <laughs> generally not, not as, we're, as we're seeing now, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, let me give you a question, okay? So, uh, uh, from the questions that we have here, I'm looking through all of these. Um, so Ash, what's your favorite asset in the crypto space? My favorite asset. Okay, so I'm going to start out giving a pretty boring answer um, because I don't want to mislead people. I think the most important asset uh, in the crypto space by a country mile is obviously Bitcoin. Uh, for people who are new to the space, that's definitely the place to begin. It's the foundation. It's the framework. Uh, it was the very first, obviously, uh, in terms of the modern cryptocurrency uh, universe, and it is still uh, by a huge margin, the most important, and the relative market capitalization uh, reflects that. Second, I would say I'm incredibly interested in Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is definitely a rising asset class. Uh, the functionality that it provides, the idea of smart contracts, which is effectively a universal computer that sounds like a little bit lofty ide uh, ideologically, but what that basically means is it's adding to Bitcoin a, a distributed ledger. It's adding the ability to do calculations uh, and to effectively do anything that you can do on any other computer on a blockchain, which is an incredibly exciting technology. Uh, and it's something that serves as the, the backbone uh, or the core of a bunch of other projects. In fact, a huge number of other projects that are based on Ethereum. So those would be the first two I would say to start with. Uh, beyond that, a couple of things that I'm really interested in, uh, I would say Chainlink. Uh, I actually recently hosted, I think it was over the weekend, uh, last weekend, a, uh, a, a panel discussion uh, at the Chainlink Smart Contract Summits. Uh, Chainlink is technology uh, that is called an oracle is the term of art that's used these days. And that basically means it's the piece of software, the middleware software that connects uh, real world data into smart contracts. So for example, uh, if we create a, a, a coin that allows us to transact uh, in Ethereum or to create a smart contract using Ethereum, the Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum standard, the, the chain link layer is the layer that determines whether or not a contract gets triggered. You know, we bet on a major league soccer match, for example, although we probably know I would never do that. Uh, and it's something that goes out. It's the piece of software that goes out and determines what the score is. That's kind of a quick and dirty way to think about it. It's obviously more complicated for, than that, but it's a pretty good metaphor. A, a couple of other things uh, that I find interesting uh, are Paxos uh, and Ripple, um, which uh, are not generally seen as the most interesting or the sexiest uh, coins, especially by people in the cryptocurrency world, because they're so tied in to the regulatory uh, and legal framework uh, of the way that the financial system and the business uh, framework of the United States works. So I think they're very interesting for that reason. They've taken great pains to be compliant. I think of those two uh, technologies uh, as, as places where the, the real world or the traditional financial system is going to meet uh, the new world that's rising, which is clearly a blockchain uh, mentality uh, that is something that is going to be much more important when we roll back and we look you know, five years in the future. Well, yeah, that's that's a lot of uh, different stuff for people to explore. So I'm I'm really excited, actually, uh, you know, for a crypto tier to uh, get uh, get going on the Real Vision platform, uh, because uh, there are a lot of different things that we can talk about. It's not just Bitcoin for people who are thinking about it, and also it's not just crypto. Uh, yeah. It's blockchain. You know, uh, a lot of what you talked about with smart contracts and chain link, et cetera, shows you that there's more to the space than just thinking about currencies there's there's a lot more to the space that you can do yeah. um, let, let me uh let me piggyback uh i'm going to ask two questions in a row uh, my uh next question is for you about uh you know we had this festival of learning i believe you spoke to pippa malmgren uh, let me ask you uh, larry is asking this ash what was your main takeaway from your talk with pippa Pip is really fascinating, and I really enjoyed the conversation with her. I think my main takeaway is that you know we spend so much of our time thinking about uh, the world through an analytic framework, through a left brain framework, so to speak. We look at numbers, uh, we look at data sets, uh, and and Pip and Malgram, I thought, brought this incredibly refreshing view, which is to say that's an, an incredibly important thing. Obviously, we know that we have to do our homework there. That's what we spend. Uh, God knows how many hours a week doing and thinking about. But there's also something that's different than that, which is the creative and intuitive uh, view of the world. And to understand how you receive signals uh, that are not hard data points, how you think about and interpret things from a creative perspective, you know, it reminded me 
the most mysterious part about science is hypothesis generation, mm -hmm. right? So where do you come up with that hypothesis to test, to either prove or disprove? We think about uh, the back end of that. We think about how the testing is conducted. We think about how the data is compiled and analyzed. But really, it's the creative process, the creative spirit uh, that is the beginning of the scientific process, uh, the scientific method. And I think that what PIPA is doing is translating that into an investment framework, which I think is an incredibly useful uh, uh, counterpoint to the way that we generally think about the world. Great. Yeah, I think that's great stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, it gets into behavioral finance uh, on some level tangentially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this one comes to us from Chris. And the question is, if you could interview anyone for Real Vision, Ed, who would it be? Yeah, I thought I saw that question just before we came on, and uh, I, I'm I'm I just want to go with the gut answer rather than go through all the different people. I was going to say Jeremy Grantham, um, and you know, actually, interestingly enough, I, I I interviewed I think it was David Samra who went to Columbia Business School, which is where I went to school, uh, and uh, he's a value investor, and I, uh, I one of the reasons he went to Columbia is because they have a value investing platform there. Um, and you know, it's a great. Uh, Warren Buffett actually went to Columbia, and the reason that, uh, the book that I read right before I, I went to business school was the Warren Buffett Way. Uh, this was back in the mid '90s, and so I, I'm interested in value investing. Always have been, but uh, w in terms of people that I'd want to get onto the platform and talk to, Jeremy Grantham actually is more interesting to me, especially because he ran money. I know uh, uh, for outside investors, I know he had uh, to deal with the tech bubble, and you know he lost all sorts of uh, clients at the the height of the tech bubble because you know he wasn't doing what people the momentum trades that people wanted. So I think he'd be a guy who could take us back over a long uh, span of history in the markets and give us a really good understanding of fundamentals, why they matter. Uh, if if anything's changed, so he'd be he'd be my guy. And what about you? Let me give this back to you. If you could inv interview someone, especially someone who's not been on the platform, who would it be? Uh, I, first of all, on Jeremy Grantham, what an important lesson for today, and how relevant that still is. Um, you know, uh, the question for me, uh, it would be it would be Ben Bernanke after three cocktails. I, I mean, <laughs> I I would love to just ask him. Uh, the question. So take us back uh, to the beginning of the financial crisis, because that's really where uh, the current framework for central banking globally developed. Uh, he was responsible for it as much as anyone. I'm curious to understand how he thought about the world at that time. Uh, and then also what he believes has happened going forward, whether it was consistent with the initial vision, whether it's departed from the initial vision, whether he still thinks uh, that that level uh, of accommodation is appropriate, if he has any misgivings, concerns, if he thinks of the risks as rising. Uh, but of course, I'd like to hear the answer that he would give in a bar uh, rather than the one that he would give uh, from the podium uh, while uh, doing a commencement speech, for example. Right. Yeah. The unfiltered uh, Bernanke, if you will. Yeah. Wouldn't the unfiltered Bernanke be the best guest imaginable? Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd, I'd definitely like to hear that. OK, I'm going to flip it back to you. So this one comes to us from Yuri. The question is, to date, who have you enjoyed interviewing the most for Real Vision? Yeah, I think that the answer is uh, Tom Murphy. Uh, the, uh, he's an Austrian economist that we spoke to, and uh, I enjoyed interviewing him because that's really more in my wheelhouse. I would say that if uh, you think of the world that we talk about as being finance and economics, I actually like the economics factor more perhaps than the finance side of things. You know, my degree undergrad was economics. My uh, uh, degree postgrad was in finance, and I marry the two. But I think that I find the macro world more interesting. You know, I I was in the bond market, but that's because it's macro, and so I think macro is very interesting. Real Vision's a macro company, but I'm as interested in the fundamentals of macro as anything else. And on our platform, we really haven't had a discussion of Austrian economics. I, you know, before the financial crisis, or the great financial crisis, you would have called me a hardcore Austrian. But you know, once the financial crisis happened, there were certain things that didn't go on, go along with that uh, that school of thought. You know, things like hyperinflation and so forth that a lot of people who 
uh, espouse uh, similar views never happen. And I think that a lot of the endogenous money people, some of the MMT people, things that they uh, introduced definitely spurred me on. And and so my, I have a melange of different schools of thought that uh, influence me. But at its core, I would say that I still find the Austrian view very good because it marries, uh, you know, economics with the real world. The real world that I saw when I was in the bond market was a world that the Austrian view very much influences. That is, is, is that when you lower interest rates to incredibly low levels, you know, you get a huge skew of money chasing certain types of asset classes, and that's not good over the longer term. Fundamentally, that's what I saw. And I think fundamentally, that's a real driver of business cycles. Yeah, that's such a great answer. Uh, and maybe that's part of the reason why you and I geek out together so much on Revision Daily Briefing. You know, most of my time uh, working in banking and fintech, uh, I spent on the fixed income side as well. And it definitely gives you a way of looking at the world. I think that's very different than people who came up on the equity side. Um, I think that it, it, it definitely kind of has a feeling that it's more grounded in reality uh, because you're not sort of speculating about this unlimited future that's out there. You're asking, OK, but can these guys make timely payments of principal and interest, yes or no? How do we make that determination? It forces a certain kind of ideological rigor or structure, I think, uh, uh, upon people who are who are in that space. And, uh, you know, to the to the economics point, and I'm going to answer the question right back to you, actually, because it's one that, that I'm you know thinking about as well. I, I think that uh, my foundation in economics wasn't academic. Uh, it was something that I actually did uh, later in my life uh, in the professional sphere. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I worked with uh, Nouriel Roubini, um, and uh, we actually had offices that were adjacent, like literally right next door to each other. We shared a common wall. And, uh, you know, you can't help but get less stupid about economics when you're sitting 10 feet away from one of the, you know, the greatest economists in the world. So he's been uh, my favorite guest. I enjoy those conversations. It was really fun to be able to have them on camera uh, that, rather than having them uh, kind of in private. And it was, it was really fun. And, and I hope to do it again soon. I'd love to have him back. Great. And by the way, let me just add that uh, when I said uh, Bob Murphy, I called him Tom Murphy. I, at least I think I did earlier, but it was Bob Murphy, the Austrian economist. So, Ash, let me let me get at you with another question for you. Uh, I'm going through, and uh, one of the questions is about Michael Lewis and Grant Williams. I know that you didn't have a chance to see that interview, yeah. but the question also goes on to ask, do you have a specific book of Michael Lewis's that is your favorite? That's a great question. I actually haven't seen it yet, as you point out, but I plan on seeing it over the weekend. I'm a huge fan of Michael Lewis. Uh, for me, it's Flash Boys, um, because it's two of the uh, things that I think I'm most interested in, which are uh, finance and technology, uh, and where those two things meet, uh, and how they become equal partners, uh, one might say, in determining uh, financial markets. It's also an incredibly well-told story. Um, in addition to that, I would probably say that Liar's Poker, like many of us guys of our generation, uh, read that book when we were when we were young guys and became intrigued by the the romance of Wall Street. You know, um, uh, let me let me uh, do another quick uh, question to you here as well. So I, I got a twofer for you, Ash. Uh, on the letter to my first year trading self, who do you think gave the best advice? What would you tell your first year trading self? I'm going to answer that one in essay form and maybe dodge the question a little bit. I thought they all had really interesting advice. Uh, I think that what was that what was most interesting about it is the fact that you can see these these three guys who are clearly uh, at uh, the top of their game, uh, and they all look at the world incredibly differently. They view trading through very different lenses, different time frames. They play in different asset classes. They think about the world very differently, and I think that's an incredibly important lesson to understand. There is no one size fits all solution. The things that I would tell uh, myself, and I think like like many people, especially people who worked uh, in finance and banking in the 90s, uh, we did very well early in our careers. We probably speculated uh, on securities, and uh, most of us didn't do so great uh, the first time out. And those are incredibly important learning experiences for people to have. I would say the most important uh, lessons to learn about that are things that often come before or that are seem too obvious to mention. Uh, it's about things like asset allocation, 
uh, position sizing, incredibly important, and risk management, understanding those things. Uh, and if you want to think about it in the crudest possible terms or the simplest possible way, it's understanding how much of what you have you can speculate with. Uh, that's a lesson that people uh, often learn the hard way. Yeah, and uh, let me just uh, piggyback on that, Ash, because I remember I was speculating in uh, call options for Valero Energy around 9-11, uh, and I also had a position in the underlying, and you know the notional um, amounts uh, uh, for my position in the options market w were massive compared to the what I had in the in the actual market. And then when 9/11 hit, uh, you know we had a few days where we the markets didn't trade, and as soon as they came back on, Valero just got crushed. You know I was thinking paradigm-wise that if anything bad happened oil prices would go up as they did in the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. But in this particular case, it was the opposite. And, right. uh, you know, time value of money, the theta for these uh, these co contracts worked against me. I sold some of them. Some of them, I, I waited it out and they tr they traded to zero. You know, they expired worthless. But the underlying asset that I had, um, it, it continued to to power forward over the longer term. I probably doubled my money, tripled my money. So that was a, a big lesson in the same way about position sizing, risk management, et cetera. Yeah, yeah it reminds me of a story. When I was working at Credit Suisse, um, there was a guy who uh, who was sitting next to me, and I, I forget, he went to Harvard Business School or something, and he was telling the story uh, and would tell the story constantly, like every day he would talk about it, uh, that one of his buddies uh, from, from business school was working at uh, one of the big internet investment banks. You remember them at the internet investment yeah. banks? Montgomery and, Securities. Yeah, there were a few of them. And, you know, this guy's roommate had was working at one of them and he was like a managing director there. He was probably 28 or 29 years old at the time. Uh, and the guy who was sitting next to me had a spreadsheet that was tracking the net worth uh, of his of his roommate. And, you know, <laughs> it seemed like every day it was going up to more astronomical proportions. I mean, at one point on paper, his roommate was worth something like, I forget the exact number, $120 million or something. And I remember saying to him, you know, has your, your friend taken a little money off the table? Has he sold some of that? And he said to me, oh, no, no, you, you don't do that. You, you clearly are very green, my friend. That's something that the culture simply doesn't support. You, you just don't do that. And I remember thinking, wow, this guy is really smart. What a profound thing to say. Long story short, <laughs> his roommate must, it went to zero. His roommate must have gotten totally wiped out. He could have taken a huge amount of money off the top and just said, hey, look, I'm selling 50% of my shares. And if you don't like it, you can fire me. What would they have done? He would have wound up with 50 million in the bank. Instead, uh, I think he got taken down to zero. Yeah, you know, um, actually I heard that uh, the insider trading um, a selling was really big uh, ahead of this air pocket that we just had. So mm. that's kind of interesting. And and speaking of which, the largest outside investor of Tesla took money off the table just now after this massive move. So there you go. Yeah. And why wouldn't you? I mean, th those are the things that you really need to think about. The impact where, where your trading life sort of uh, has an intersection point with your real life. Uh, and sometimes I think if we're not careful, if we think about these things too too abstractly and you start talking about, wow, the culture simply doesn't support it. You just get off sides with reality. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, I'm going to give you a, yet another question here. Uh, when you interview people, regardless of the show, how much do you prepare? Uh, do you do considerable reading or is it kind of just a conversation that you have with them? You know, ideally, I try to. I love doing research. Uh, and uh, when, when time permits it, I like to do as much reading as I humanly can. The key to doing these interviews, I find, is that you want to do as much research as you possibly can. You want to write it up. Uh, you want to have a really you know, crisp document. You want to have everything lined up. And then the minute the interview starts, you just forget about it. you got to be in the moment, and you got to connect with the person and be dynamic enough to go where it goes. Uh, otherwise, you just wind up... Uh, you wind up being uh, the kid giving the book report who's just uh, who's just asking the questions that are in front of your face. And that's not a good thing. Yeah. And, you know, let me say that I know that there are different styles of interview with people here at Real Vision. Some people like the serendipity of uh, just in the moment finding certain things out. I think my personal view is I like to be prepared both generically and uh, and also specifically for that interview. So I think it's good to have you know a good macro background to the topics that you're going to be talking about, but then drill down specifically to what this person's saying. And the reason is is because it's more interesting for the interviewee. I mean, if you if you're shoehorning them into uh, your specific 
uh, questions, irrespective of who they are, then that's not interesting. I remember I used to do interviews myself for uh, BBC in particular, and I, every time, eventually I got to the point where I was like, okay, I have my talking points in my head. I, whatever they ask me, I'm going to steer it towards those talking points because there are certain right. things I actually want to say. And I know that they're not going to ask me the, the right questions. They're just going to ask me what's what's uh, you know what they want to ask me, not what I actually want to uh, to say. So yeah. I, I I'm very cognizant of that. Yeah, you know it's interesting. I one of the things that we get very often is when we do we we contact uh, guests. We have a very often a long conversation with them before you see them uh, come on the air. And one of the questions that I get most often is like, so what are the questions you're going to ask? And and my answer is always like, well, what what do you want to talk about? Tell, tell me about what you're most interested in. And I think that that's where Real Vision really differentiates itself uh, from some of the other financial news networks, because we don't come to it with an agenda. At least I don't. I know that you don't in the way that we think about them. It's always understanding uh, what where that person is coming from. And of course, that we have our own ideas. We have our own gaps that we're trying to fill. We have our own questions we want to answer. But I think it's really about being open to understanding a new way of looking at the world. And, you know, that actually brings us to another point that's something that I wanted to talk about, uh, because it's something that I see a lot. Uh, in the comments. So one of the interesting things I think about Real Vision Daily Briefing is how we look at the world through different lenses. Um, you know, that is to say, we look at, uh, we look, we interview traders, uh, people who are, you know, coming, waking up uh, at uh, nine o'clock, you know, starting work at nine o'clock in the morning, totally flat, uh, and then closing out their positions at the end of the day. Uh, and on the other extreme, we look at people who have very long-term uh, analytic frameworks from a macroeconomic standpoint, uh, all kinds of different ways of looking at the world. And it's interesting in the comments, sometimes I'll see someone uh, who writes, you know, oh, thanks so much. We love ha having these tactical traders on who are talking about how they trade their books. And other times people will say, no, that's not what I come to Real Vision for. I'm looking for something that's a little bit more macro oriented. I'm looking for something that's a longer time horizon. I'm looking for something that's a broader framework. You know, for me, and I think for you as well, we come from a world where we do think about things uh, from a macro framework, from a little bit broader perspective. I just think it's so incredibly useful uh, to have those varied lenses, varied sort of focal lengths when you think about the lens that you view the world through, because I, we all have something to learn. Um, you know, these are these are these are ways of looking at markets and ways of working uh, through these issues uh, that people have a lot of different experience and, and, and varied experience. In. And I just think it's so incredibly important to have the opportunity to step outside of your comfort zone a little bit and to see the world through a different lens. Yeah, well said, Ash, I have to say. I, I agree with you 100 percent. Question is here, honestly, where do you think Bitcoin will go in the next few years? Do you really believe that governments will just allow a decentralized currency to dethrone their power? Ash, what do you think? Yeah, so not a terribly uh, exciting answer, but up. I think it's going to go up, probably not surprisingly. Uh, you know, I try not to think about or obsess about the price points too much. I'm interested in the broader revolution that's happening. Um, I do think that uh, if you if we come back five years from now and we have this conversation, I think in all probability uh, that the price of Bitcoin is going to be higher than it is today. Do I think uh, that world governments and central banks are going to allow Bitcoin uh, to dethrone their power? The short answer is is probably not. Uh, but I think that uh, it is something that the decentralized asset world uh, is going to become a larger part of the global financial system. I think that that's uh, almost unavoidable at this point. I think it's going to be a balancing act. I think there's going to be a, a dialectic that's going to happen uh, between the uh, digital asset community and uh, the, the halls of power, the traditional halls of power, central banks and governments. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting. Actually, I, I was reading a, a piece uh, that Nick Carter wrote uh, as an editorial for a mild shop Coindesk last night that explored some of these issues. And I think that these are going to be some of the most important issues uh, of the 20th century finance, that uh, 21st century finance, I should say, as we think through these uh, think through these questions. It's not clear to me that there are obvious solutions, um, but I suspect uh, that there are going to be intense debates and that there, we're going to we're simply just going to have to expand the way that we look at the universe. The other point I would probably make is that I think central bank digital currencies are going to be something that we are going to be hearing a lot more about. I think that central banks uh, are going to be incredibly interested in co-opting some of the underlying technologies uh, for blockchain and digital ledger and bringing them into uh, the more traditional financial system. I guess the question will inevitably come up, are those truly uh, digital assets at all? I mean, the answer is technically, yes, they are, in fact, digital assets, even if they're run by central banks. But in many ways, uh, the spirit of central bank issued digital currency versus the spirit of Bitcoin, uh, it really is the difference between night and day. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer. And I agree pretty much 100% with what you said. I would say that the two questions, you can uh, extricate them, meaning that the, the second question doesn't logically follow from the first, just right. because uh, governments uh, are not allowing a decentralized currency to dethrone their power doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't go up. So Bitcoin can go right. up, but then at the same time, you can still have a fiat currency world. I mean, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, a lot of people got into them because they wanted a refuge from the fiat currency world. But just because the governments aren't allowing them to, uh, you know, uh, to dethrone their power doesn't mean that there isn't more uh, demand for cryptocurrencies and therefore that those currencies will go up. I think it's interesting the connection point that you made, which is that as this demand for those cryptocurrencies will go up, uh, the governments will try to thwart them to a certain degree by taking the basic underlying uh, technology and then using them in a non-decentralized, in a very centralized way in yeah. order to uh, defeat uh, the, uh, the, the desire to have them. The last point I would add is, is that obviously so some countries are, are going to be more successful than others at uh, beating back uh, the advance of uh, decentralized uh, currencies, and cryptocurrencies. Uh, but you know, if you're in the, if you're in a, a less developed economy or yeah. an economy where you know the currency is not convertible, there's a lot of desire to uh, to have an asset that you can go into. Uh, it used to be the dollar, but increasingly it's going to be cryptocurrency. Yeah, and those are such important points. And and I think, as you correctly point out, this really is a, a very nuanced and complex issue. You know, my feeling is uh, that there is a there is a, a theme in the cryptocurrency community, what what sometimes called crypto utopianism, uh, this idea that uh, that cryptocurrency is this rising force, as I think it is, but a rising force that's going to change the world and just absolutely overthrow everything it touches. Uh, my own sense is that uh, that the power of government. Uh, to uh, to to act on its citizens uh, to force certain outcomes or to disallow other outcomes is much greater than many uh, in the cryptocurrency community give it credit for. Uh, that said, I also think that the converse is true, uh, meaning that people who look at cryptocurrency as a toy uh, or as a thing that uh, that governments can simply uh, disallow at will uh, also not the correct answer. It is much more nuanced than that, uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see how those uh, those two different views those two different perspectives in many cases diametrically opposed pr perspectives sort themselves out as we move forward great conversation Ash. i think we did a soup to nuts of a, a bunch of different stuff we have to do this more often i really appreciate uh, talking to you today yeah let's not do it at nine o'clock in the morning next time <laughs> no definitely not <laughs> thanks for joining us you bet